All right, let's get started. Good morning from COD North, otherwise known as my office. And it's time for another exciting morning of chemistry with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, today's game plan. We're going to go through the lab that you're going to be doing today, handing it on Tuesday. And then afterward, what I'd like to do today is go through a number of practice problems with equilibrium and equilibrium related stuff and assets and bases. So you'll do good because you all should have gotten the email with test number four password. And hopefully you did. Just checking my chat. And with that, let's get started. Let's do the lab first. Now, you should be able to download the following lab. And I haven't done it for a while, so I better do it. Thumbs up, people. Do you see the titration lab? Thank you. All right, today's lab deals with a titration. And a titration is where you add a certain amount of acid or base of unknown molarity to a certain amount of acid or base of a known molarity. Or right? I have it differently, I'm backward on my thing, or I just said it backwards. But at neutralization, that's when all the acid and base reacts, pH 7, then the following is true. Moles of acid, moles of base, equals moles of base. How do you know this is happening when you're at neutralization? Use that pH indicator. A pH indicator is a chemical that changes color at certain pHs. Now, quick tea break. The most widely used pH indicator is called phenothalium. And phenothalium changes exactly at 7.0 pH. It goes from a clear color to a violet or wine color. My sisters tell me, you don't know your colors. Well, I know red, green, and blue, but they're right. Sometimes I don't, the uh, fancier colors I don't get right. But let's look at something. I turn off the sound on this. And this is a titration. Yes, thumbs up, people. Can you see the yeah, thank you? All right. I can move along. This is not the one I wanted. Well, all right, let's do this one. Now, this is a setup. This is called the burette. And let me just check because I've been bouncing around. Thumbs up, people. Can you see the burette? Thank you. All right. And this has scales on it, just like a graduated cylinder. This is called the valve, or it used to be called the stopcock. And it's a way of controlling the liquid, how much whatever acid or base you're adding. Now, this is an Erlenmeyer flask. And this has been designed to allow you to swirl, mix the contents in here. Remember the collision theory of reactions, and that is molecules have to collide. And by stirring it, you're giving it more energy and allowing it to collide faster. 
in here, I'm going to assume that's phenothalian. They're doing vinegar. We're doing something differently. Now, if we back up, you'll see they've added, notice the color change down here. Now, as soon as you mix it, reaction occurs and not all the acid has been neutralized. So you'll add some more. Now, the way this person is doing it is wrong. If you know how to do titrations, you have constant stirring while you're at what she's doing now you should do while you're adding it, and you can do it much faster. But notice how she's adding a small amount and then adding some more, and notice the color change. And you keep on adding, in our case, we'll be adding base to an acid until the color change doesn't go away. And then when you get closer, you add less titration or titrant, and she's still doing it too fast, but you can take the valve if you know how to use that and add a drop at a time. She's doing it this amateur rookie way. And she's coming up on it. Now she's going real slow, which is how you should do in a titration. Too slow, you can go a little faster. Two days later, and notice how the colors change and that's the end point. Now, it's a very faint, faint pink. And if you put too much in, you'll go past that. Now, let me do one thing real quick. When you work in industry, this picture here, these are dosimat. And these are what you saw earlier, but they're electronic. And the nice thing about a dosimat is you can control how much you add, and you have control up to a thousandth of a milliliter, which you can't get with a glass burette. One lab I got hired to fix, I told the CEO of the company, we need 10 of these. They're about eight, ten thousand dollars a piece now. Back then they were five thousand. They said, Do you really think it'll make a difference? I said, let's buy one and you'll see. And it did. And they bought the other nine. And since I'm gonna be careful, they everybody see the vitamin C lab? Thumbs up, thank you. And so what you're gonna do is find out how much of a certain chemical is in a certain product. And that certain chemical or product is called vitamin C. I think you're all familiar with it. You can go out and buy vitamin C tablets, which are important supplement if you don't get them naturally. Now, vitamin is a shortened version, it was shortened years, eons ago, Originally, they called these chemicals vital amines. Amine is a certain type of grouping of atoms in a molecule. If you take organic chemistry, you'll learn about that. And the vital amines were molecules that were thought to be important, vital to keeping you alive. Well, it turned out they first of all shortened vital amines to vitamin. 
Next, because this was eons ago, they made a mistake. Not all vitamins have amines in them, but they're still called vitamins. And vitamin C does not have an amine in it, but it is an acid. It's also known as ascorbic acid, which is an acid. Duh. But anyways, you can determine the amount of vitamin C in a tablet of vitamin C by titration. And that's what you're going to be doing in this lab. That's called quality control. When you make something, how do you know you made it right? Well, in the chemical industry and drug industry, you run certain tests called specifications. And a key specification for vitamin C tablets is they tell you there's supposed to be X grams of vitamin C in the vitamin C tablet. They prove to themselves before they ship it by what's called quality control and they do a titration. Now, since vitamin C is an acid, the moles of vitamin C, the acid, will equal the moles of the base at neutralization. But unlike stuff you've already done, vitamin C is a solid. And we know for moles of a solid, in this case, or any compound, grams of the solid, in this case, vitamin C, divided by the molecular weight, one mole per molecular weight, equals moles. Therefore, if you tell, also know that moles of a base equals the milliliters times the moles times a thousand. For this one, we do need the thousand milliliters. Molarity times milliliters. Therefore, if you combine this with this, you can find out that grams of vitamin C when you titrate it is the molecular weight of vitamin C times the milliliters of base you use times the molarity, moles per liter, thousand milliliters of base. Now, it turns out if you look online, Dr. White was nice and helped you out. The molecular weight, the three significant figures is 176. Hint, use significant figures in this lab. You'll be using a 0 0.11 capital M NaOH solution. You know that's moles per liter of sodium hydroxide. And again, this is three significant figures. And you'll be using phenothalium. And to find out how many grams of vitamin C are in the actual tablet of vitamin C, you'll use this equation A. Now, let's go through the procedure. If you were in the lab, this is a fun lab to do. Since you want to dissolve something, and I spelled mortar wrong here. Ah, Dr. White was always the first one down the spelling bee, and I missed that. Even my spell check doesn't like Dr. White. A mortar and pestle is something you crush things in. It's probably the oldest food processing. Let's take a look at one. And in the lab, you'd use something like this. I hope you all. Can everybody see the mortar and pestles? Thank you. And these are food ones, but these are the type you'd use in the lab like this. And they're even fancier ones called agate. And I've used these. Uh, you'd use something like this. Now, Dr. White's a chemist, and I don't have a picture to show you, but I have a collection of four different size mortar and pestles and they're all made out of very fine crystal glass. I bought them one day when I was walking in by a shopping area in The Hague in the Netherlands. I saw them in the window. Immediately they said to me, buy me. And guess what? I did. And you put stuff in here and use this to crush it. And that helps dissolve it better in the Erlenmeyer. Now, what you'll do is crush the vitamin C, get it into an Erlenmeyer, add some water and swirl it until it's dissolved. It takes about two minutes. Add about five drops of the phenothalian. That's the compound. 
that changes color when the pH is seven. Then you'll fill the burette almost to the top with sodium hydroxide solution. You'll record the starting volume and you'll slowly add sodium hydroxide with swirling until you see a color change that does not go away. Now, common mistake students make is they go way past the end point. As soon as they get the faintest color, you should stop. They don't, and they add more sodium hydroxide solution, which is a common mistake. Now, once you see the color change and it does not go away, you're done, and you record the final volume. And finally, when you're done with the lab, everything goes in the proper waste container, the sodium hydroxide from the burette and the material in your uh, Erlenmeyer. Now, normally when you do a titration, you always do it in duplicate. And if you are in the lab, you do this twice. But since you're not, I'm just giving you data for one run. Now, the initial volume of the material, the sodium hydroxide in the burette, the reading was five. Then the final volume was 32.9. Notice one past the decimal, one past the decimal. Now, the volume of sodium hydroxide you added would be D minus C. As I mentioned earlier, the molarity of the sodium hydroxide is this. And now use equation A above to calculate the grams in the tablet. Now, here are the questions. How many grams did you find? Now, if you look at this web page, question two, you'll see that company's uh, vitamin C is this amount in the tablet. Now, how many grams of vitamin C is in each tablet? Remember, one gram equals 500 milligrams. I'll let you figure that out on your own. Now, the question is, was your tablet of vitamin C in specification? And how do you know that? Now, you're not familiar with it, but depending on the company and specifications, generally, if you're within, depending on the company, one, five, or eight percent, let's use 5% of what theoretical is your in specification, plus or minus that amount. And finally, question four, what possible sources of error was in your titration for vitamin C? And that's today's lab. It's more fun in the lab, but you can go look online and YouTube and look up titrations of different things with phenothalian and find out how they do it and take a look at it. Now, there's a Zoomster lab, which I got to look at today. If you want to look at it, go ahead if you don't want. But you'll be graded on uploading the lab that I gave you. And I hate to say this, today's the last lab. Next week, we don't have any more labs. I'll just be doing a review. And any questions on the lab? Going once, going twice. Well, in that case, let me close this. All right, what I like to do for the rest of our time together is the following, and that is go through important things you should know for test number four. We've done some of this, but practice makes perfect, and I'll call my thumbs up people. Do you see chapter, thank you. I didn't even get a chance to say it. You already got your thumbs up. You guys are special. All of you are special to me. And so let's get going. In the collision theory, what are key factors that are needed? Name one of them that are needed in order for a chemical reaction to occur. And one is reactions, reactant molecules must collide. 
Another one is collisions must have enough energy to have a reaction occur. And finally, the orientation. Now, when we talk about activation energy, what is that? That's the amount of energy needed to make a reaction occur. Now, how do you make a reaction go faster? Well, you can add more reactants. You can increase the reaction temperature. Remember, rule of thumb. Can you see it? It's written right here. Small writing, but it's there. For every 10 degrees increase in the reaction temperature, the reaction rate doubles. For every 10 degrees increase of the reaction temperature, to see that is, the reaction rate doubles. And the last way to do a a uh, uh, get a reaction to go faster is add a catalyst. Now, here I asked you to draw the energy diagram for something. Remember, conservation of energy, the total energy here equals energy here. On the y-axis here is energy. This is time. You start out with a certain amount of energy. This is exothermic. You give off heat. Therefore, ammonia, since it's given off some energy, has less energy than the combined energy of the starting materials. Therefore, it's lower in an exothermic reaction. And you go up the hill and down the hill to grandmother's house you go. God, I don't know where I picked that up, but I can't stop saying that. But anyways, important thing to remember, from where you start to the top of the hill, is the activation energy. Now, how do you lower the activation energy? A catalyst would lower the activation energy. Does that say ERT? Excuse me, well, repeat that again. I said, does that say ERT? Yes. I'll. Oh. I'll do it here. Magnifying glass time. It's E A activation energy E A C T for activation. That's an A, that's the awful C, and that's a T. Now, if you were to add a catalyst to this. I'll abbreviate, what happens is the catalyst lowers the hill, so it's going over faster. Now we're only going here. And what a catalyst does, hopefully you can see that's act. A catalyst lowers the activation energy. Now, for a endothermic reaction, how do you know it's endothermic? Because you're adding heat. You have a certain amount of energy total on this side and a certain energy here of the molecules. Now, some of the energy is from the heat. Therefore, water has less energy than the products. So that's why this is lower, this is higher. Now you can see it clear the activation energy is still from where you start to the top of the hill. Now, K equilibrium is the concentration of each product to the power of the coefficient divided by the concentration of each reactant to the power of the reactant. Common mistakes students do, and this is wrong, And I'm telling you this so you don't make the mistake. They put a plus sign there. No, it's multiplication. 
That's why I made these dots here instead of just, you could have written it this way, which is perfectly correct. And if I were grading it, which I will be the one grading the test, That's a two. This also tells me it's multiplication. But there's no plus. People look at this, students, and think, oh, there's a plus sign there. I better put it here. No, it's multiplication. All right, next thing we talked about, and you should be familiar with, is relative amounts of products and reactants. How do you know which is greater or smaller when you look at the equilibrium constant? When the equilibrium constant, A, EQ, is greater than one, notice this is 10 to the fourth, which is a thousand, so this would be 2,000. The products amounts, and that's why I have the brackets here, are always more than the reactants. And this is the opposite. When the reactants, and in case you can't see this, this is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 34, which is a number much, much less than one, Therefore, that's what these three dots mean, the reactants are greater than the products. And you should be familiar with that. Now let's talk about Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier's principle is a equilibrium under stress shifts to the side that removes the stress. The other thing you should also know is at equilibrium, the forward and reverse rates are the same. At equilibrium, the forward and reverse rates are of reaction are the same. But let's look at this. At equilibrium, there's a certain amount of chlorine, certain amount of water, certain amount of HCl, certain amount of oxygen. And now, what happens if you add more water? Well, there was a certain amount of water, and now there's more water. And the equilibrium says, oh, no, we've got too much water. We've got to get rid of it. The only way it can get rid of water is if water reacts with chlorine to make more HCl and oxygen. Why? Because when something is reacted, it's consumed, and the amount you have goes down. Just like if you have two cookies and you consume one of them, oh no, you only have one left. You have less cookies because you consumed one, otherwise known as you ate a cookie. And therefore, more water, it wants to go to this side to get rid of it, to the blue side. And therefore, if this is consumed, the chlorine is consumed, so you have less. Now, if you look at on this side, because the chlorine is reacting with the water, this makes more HCl, more oxygen. If you make more of something, you're going to have more of it, and it increases. Let's look at the following. Now let's do the next one. This is a reaction where the plus sign disappeared. There it is. All right, if you take carbon dioxide, water, and heat, this is an endothermic reaction because you're adding heat, you make carbon dioxide and water. What do you know about the rate of reactions for this equilibrium? Uh, time's up. At equilibrium, the forward and reverse rates for this reaction are the same. And it's always at equilibrium. 
until you add something to mess it up. Now here, let me remind you. You put something in an ice bath, you remove heat. If you put something in boiling water, you're adding heat. So let's look at this one. Notice heat is on this side. What happens to the CO, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen gas content amount, concentration, if you put the reaction in an ice bath. Now, what does an ice bath do? It removes heat. So at equilibrium, there was a certain amount of heat. And now the reaction, the equilibrium says, oh no, we don't have enough heat. So how does it make more heat? Well, there's only one way. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen react to make more heat, but they'll also make more water and carbon monoxide. So the question asks, what happens to the amount of CO? Well, if you're gonna make more heat, you're gonna make more CO, and that's why it increases. Now, also what happens to the hydrogen? If this reacts with this to make more heat, this is consumed. Remember, like the cookies, if you had two cookies and you ate one, oh, you only have one left, but you're gonna consume some of the hydrogen and therefore it will decrease. Now let's do B. What happens to the reaction? In other words, the carbon monoxide and hydrogen concentration if you put the, be the reaction in a beaker of boiling water. Boiling water adds heat. At equilibrium, there was a certain amount of heat. Now there's more heat and the equilibrium, equilibrium says, oh no, we have too much heat. We've got to get rid of it so we're in equilibrium. And therefore, the Chatelier's principle says, how does it get rid of excess heat? It reacts with water and carbon monoxide to make more CO2 and hydrogen. And now we have, if we're reacting this, it's being consumed there's gonna be less. Therefore, there's gonna be less here and here. And if we notice this decreases, there's less. If it's reacting to consume the heat to go this way, you'll make more of this and this. You make more of something, the amount you have will increase. All right, let's move on to chapter 14, because I see the clock is ticking. Actually, I don't, have, I don't think I have a clock anymore that ticks. But anyways, the numbers are going bigger. All right, thumbs up, people. Can you see chapter 14? Thank you. All right. Chapter 14 deals with acids and bases, and you should know what is an acid a proton donor. What is a base? A proton acceptor, proton being H plus. You should also know the following, which is an acid, which is a base, which is a salt. If you, for this 
class, if it begins with an H, it's an acid. If it has an o, OH in it, it's a base. And if it has a nitrogen in it, it's a base. And I think you all know sodium, oh, excuse me, sodium chloride is a salt. Now, one of the things I don't have here, but I should tell you, remember, dilute acids taste sour. I don't like sour. Well, certain things I do. And if you do shots of vinegar, don't, but it'll taste sour. If you suck on a lemon or lime, why is it sour? Because there's acid in there, citric acid. Now, one of the most important things I will teach you this whole semester is the concept of pH. And pH is a way of determining as a solution of water, so it's always an aqueous solution, acidic, basic, or neutral. And here, pH is equal minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And if I ask you what's the pH of a solution that has a hydronium ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus three, the, and is it acidic, basic, or neutral pH you're trying to find? You're given this. Here's the equation. You'll be given that in test four. Remember, I gave out the uh, password this morning in an email you all should have gotten. And if we put this in from here, remember my gift. If this is 1.0, then the pH is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x. In this case, x is 3. Therefore, the pH is 3. Now, this will not be given to you important information. You need to memorize this. And I think this will be handy the rest of your life. pH scale goes from 0 to 14. pH scale goes from 0 to 14. At 7, you're at a neutral pH. The hydroxide concentration equals the hydronium ion concentration. Above 7, you're basic. The closer to 14, the more basic. And you learned that in the food chemistry lab, I hope. And here, basic means hydroxide concentration is greater than hydronium ion concentration. Hydronium H3O plus, hydroxide OH minus. Now, if you're below seven, it's acidic. And the pH below seven, notice this is three. Hopefully, you all know that's less than seven. And therefore, this is acidic. Oh, let's do one more. Here's the pH you're trying to find. You're given this as the hydronium ion concentration. You're asked, is this acid base or neutral, acidic base or neutral? You put this in here. Remember, 1.0 times 10 to the minus x. This whole thing is then equal to x. x here is 12. Remember, 7 neutral, above 7 basic, below 7 acidic. 12 is above 7, it's basic. Now, let's look at another problem. What if you're given this? The hydroxide concentration is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3. What is the pH of the solution? And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Well, you need to do two steps, because you're trying to find pH and pH is minus log of the hydronium ion concentration, but you're given the hydroxide. So the first step, you have to use Kw. Yep, that's me. No, not really. I wish it was. The ionization, water ionization constant, hydronium ion concentration times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And here, we want to solve for this. So how do we get rid of this? We divide by it. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And now this cancels out. I'll rewrite it. 
a message to the wise, hopefully all our wise, on test number four and all my tests on final, show your work. Because if you make a math there or other things and you don't show your work, I give you zero points. You show your work, I can give you partial credit, which I'd like to do, but you got to show your work. All right. We now have this becomes this, this is this. We put in the numbers and you get this. The hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. And therefore, here, we now have this. Are we done? No, we're trying to find pH. So you need a second step. Solve for pH. pH equals minus the hydronium ion concentration. We just calculated that out. We put it here. When this whole thing is, when the inside is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, minus the log of this is x. In this case, 11. 11 is greater than 7. It's basic. Time out for quick puzzler from Dr. White. Coca-Cola, or my favorite is Dr. Pepper, or Werner's. If you've never tried Werner's, you can get it at Jewel. Werner's is a very high carbonated, spicy ginger ale. Dr. White loves Werner's. I've been drinking that since I was a little kid because my father loved Werner's. It's good ginger, it's really good. And I like, love double, Dr. Pepper, Coke, no. But if you had a can or glass of Dr. Pepper, Coke or 7-Up or whatever your favorite pop is, and you measured the pH, you would see it's two or three. And you would say, oh, that's acidic. And here's my puzzle for you. Why is pop acidic? Where's that game show music? Dun, 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 dun. Time's up. Why is it acidic? Because there's an acid present. Acid makes things acidic. Base makes things basic. And in pop, there's carbonic acid, which makes it acidic. And that's why some people, I've never tried it. You can remove rust with Coke and Pepsi because rust will react with an acid. Don't try that though. See all the neat things you're learning in my class? Amazing. All right, once again, I'm gonna call on my favorite peanut gallery, the thumbs up people. Can you see the problem set? Thank you. By the way, if you write chem 1211 on your thumb, no, don't. All right, let's move on. Now, when we talk about pH, remember above seven becomes more basic below seven becomes more acidic. And now here, number 10, what happens to the numerical value of the pH of a beaker of water at pH seven if you add a few drops of concentrated NaOH solution? Well, first of all, you have to know NaOH is a base. OH stuff is always base. And when you add a base to anything, the pH increases. Now, next one, what happens when you add a few drops of concentrated H2SO4? You should know this is an acid. H2SO4 begins with an H, sulfuric acid, and when you add an acid, the pH goes down. I like what I just did with my voice. pH goes down. And now you know that. Now let's talk about what happens to the pH numerical value. Remember, I'm not asking you the trend, but the numerical value of the pH of a beaker of a buffer solution. If you add a few drops of dilute acid or a few drops of dilute base, by definition, hold on, tea time. 
big T time, a buffer solution resists change in pH when you add a small amount of acid or base. So therefore, the buffer solution stays the same, whether you add a small amount of acid or base. And finally, here I'd like to talk about titrations. If you have to add 1.35 times 10 to the third milliliters of a 1.53 capital M, no, you know that molarity, NaOH solution to neutralize 1.87 times 10 squared milliliters of aqueous HCl solution, HCl acid solution, what's the molarity of the hydrochloric acid solution? Well, what are we trying to find? Molarity of HCl and acid. What are we given? Milliliters and molarity of a base. What are we also given? The milliliters of the acid. At neutralization, moles of acid equals moles of base. Milliliters of acid times molarity of acid equals milliliters of base times molarity. What are we solving for? The molarity of the acid. Therefore, I want to get rid of lines on the wrong side. Should be over here, the milliliters. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. Molarity of acid equals milliliters of base times mol molarity of base divided by milliliters. Remember, you're doing a titration today in your lab. And therefore, molarity of HCl, milliliters of base, molarity of base, milliliters of acid. Notice milliliters divided by milliliters cancel out. We're just left with molarity. Even though this says NaOH, you're looking for the HCl. And three, 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 three significant figures. And there you go. And I think I did this one already. All right. Now, this morning when I was getting things set up for today's Zoom meeting, our time together, I realized, nope, I shouldn't have had a V8. I realized, oh no, I forgot to teach you something very important. And now it's time to learn one of Dr. White's family secrets. My father was an outstanding cook. My mother was a very good cook. My father was better. Now, Dr. White has two sisters. So it was just me and my father as the men in the house and my mother and two sisters. And on certain Sundays, my father would plan and say, this Sunday is men only cooking, women out of the kitchen. And one of the things we had in our house, and I even have my house, is a huge freezer. My freezer, the separate freezer is bigger than my refrigerator. And I can cook a lot of things and freeze them. And if you're or industrial organic chemist like I am with my training, we call that batch making or making a lot of something and freezing it in smaller amounts. And he used to like to make a lot of one of his favorite all things was spaghetti sauce. And Dr. White was taught my father's, Mr. White's secret for spaghetti sauce. I don't know how he found out about it or came up with it, but I do know throughout his career as a pharmacist, he met a lot of interesting people and got to be friends with them. One of them, if you know your jazz, one of the famous jazz players of all time in Chicago was Ramsey Lewis. My father got to know Ramsey Lewis and his family because they were near his drugstore and they were customers who liked my father. And whenever Ramsey Lewis would come into town, my father, when he was still alive, would always get free tickets to his concert and he'd go. All right, let's look at the following. All right, what my father did was you take tomato sauce, hold on. I won't write it out, I'll tell you. You take tomato sauce and you put in some seasonings. You take fresh tomatoes and you 
uh, crush them and strain them through a special tomato sieve, it's called, that was my job, and tomato paste and water, and you'd have some onions in there and garlic and other seasoning, and you'd cook it. Now, what you don't know is in tomatoes and tomato paste, there's an acid, and that's called citric acid. And what my father did, oh, one other thing. My father would also put, and we'd make like three gallons when we do this, a small amount, like a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon. If you ever make spaghetti sauce yourself and go, hmm, that doesn't taste like that fancy restaurant I went to, Italian restaurant, that's because they put a small amount of cinnamon in there. And that makes it taste really good. But the secret, don't tell anybody, was at the very end in the tomato sauce is a citric acid and acid. And he put in some sodium bicarbonate. You should know the structure of sodium bicarbonate, which is baking powder. And what happens is this neutralizes the acid, like a titration, but not really. And you make, this is called sodium citrate plus water plus carbon dioxide. And you'll see this as a gas. This arrow means it's a gas. And you'll see bubbles. and it actually looks like a white foam on top. Now, when you do this in a big pot, and I'm talking like a three gallon pot of sauce, if you make less, do less, you put about a tablespoon in, but that's a lot. For less, you put a lot less in, and that neutralizes the acid in there. Now, the acid gives it its real tart taste, and by putting a little sodium bicarbonate in there, you neutralize the acid and it makes it taste milder and better. Now, true story. I gave out the secret recipe to a 12, 11 student long ago and later in the semester, near the end of the semester, a week or so later or however it was, uh, actually it was a 12, 12 organic chemistry. So there was more time. Student comes to me and says, thank you. I said, you're welcome. Now tell me what you're thanking me for. And she said, your secret recipe and trick with the spaghetti sauce. I said, well, you're welcome, but why are you thanking me? She said, well, I and my father both suffer badly from acid reflux. That's where it's conditioned, your stomach acids, remember there's acid in your stomach. That's why the pH is so low in your stomach because there's acid present would come up and burn her esophagus. And actually I worked at one company where a colleague of mine had it so bad, he had to actually have an operation to help fix that. Well, anyway, she told me that my father and I love Italian food and spaghetti sauce and meatballs. I didn't tell you, my father and I also made meatballs. They were delicious, he was a great cook. which by the time I was six, I was cooking, which unlike most men, well, now it might change a little, but when I grew up, most men didn't know how to cook. Dr. White did. But anyways, she said, now, since you lower the acid content, instead of eating something that irritated our esophagus with the acid in there, the tomato sauce had a lower pH, Remember when you add base, or wait, higher pH, I'm sorry. And therefore, it had less acid and irritated less, and we can enjoy spaghetti sauce now with our spaghetti. Thank you. And I thanked her for thanking me. And that's my, remember, the trick is, first of all, make it taste right, add a pinch of cinnamon. Don't want, I had a friend of mine who added like a tablespoon to a small amount, and the only thing you could taste in that whole thing was cinnamon. You couldn't even taste any tomatoes. 
the overpower that with cinnamon, you got to be careful. By the way, cinnamon is an organic molecule, a chemical too, which I teach in my Chem 170 at ECC. But anyways, add the sodium bicarbonate. Now, do I have time for one more thing? Yes, I do. I forgot to tell you another thing that won't be on the test, but Dr. White at times in my life have done, I've done some really stupid things. I think we all have done stupid things. Now this was a real stupid thing. Let's go out to the internet. Yes, yeah, my thumbs up, people. Can you see the Spice House? This is probably one of the finest places in the Chicagoland area to get spices. They have a store in Chicagoland, in Chicago, another one in Evanston. I used to go to the Evanston one. Now, I just because of the virus and everything, I order online. Now, a couple of years ago, and by the way, I've helped these people out when they had a problem with their balances. I showed them how to get better balances when I was in their store one time and the owner was thankful. But I had gone into their store and they have, and if you ever go in their store, they have bottles of everything, what you can buy. And they had something new and it was called ground habanero chilies. If you know your chilies, habanero is awfully, awfully, extremely hot chili. And here was a powder. And so I bought a jar and it's worth every penny of it. Notice it's not cheap, but their stuff is the best. Back times when I've been in there, I've actually met the owner introduced me. Some of the top chefs in Chicago who are buying their spices at the Spice House. Now, Here's what Dr. White did. I went home, opened it. I wonder how hot it is. And here's the stupidest thing I ever did. There was a little powder on top of this ground. I went like this and went like that immediately. I didn't feel heat. It was instant pain. My tongue was pain. Wherever it touched the inside of my mouth, not hot, pain. Like I got to go to the hospital. But luckily, Dr. White knows organic chemistry. The chemical, and this won't be on a test ever, but the chemical in all peppers that are hot is capsaicin. That's the band. Well, I can't find it right now, but capsaicin is a chemical. The more that's in there, the hotter it is. And there's a lot in the habanero. I can go about one minute late, but it's a good thing for you to learn. And capsaicin is nonpolar. And you know, like dissolves life. And water, if you drink water, isn't going to do anything in there because it's polar. And the capsaicin on your tongue and making you in pain, I was in serious pain, was nonpolar. Well, I happened to be standing right next to my refrigerator under where I was standing also was the drawer with my silverware. I immediately pulled open the drawer, got a tablespoon out, whipped open the door of my refrigerator, grabbed the big container of mayonnaise, went by the sink, tablespoon of mayonnaise, switch it out, spit it out, do a second one, spit it out, no pain. How did that happen? In mayonnaise, half of the weight of mayonnaise is vegetable oil. And that's nonpolar. And like the cells like, took the capsaicin off my tongue, my lips were burning by that time, my mouth, and it got it out. Now, if you've ever been in a restaurant where somebody eats something hot and is in pain, what's one thing they give them? Milk. If you ever go to a place, and I'm not into buffalo wings, 
But when they serve those blazing hot buffalo wings, they always have a celery with a dipping sauce. Both milk and those dipping sauce have a lot of oil or fat. Those are nonpolar. And that's how you got to. Now, I could if I wanted to, if I thought, but it was easier to get the mayonnaise than my vegetable oil. I could have done shots of vegetable oil and spit it out, and that would have worked. And now you learn something new, how light dissolves like. If you ever are suffering from pain from eating something hot, eat something with oil or vegetable oil or fat in it. And some people also, if you take and eat butter on bread, that will help. Why? Because the butter is nonpolar. Not the bread won't help, but the butter. So with that, my time's up. Don't forget tomorrow, test number four is due by nine. And with that, I'll wish you goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Day and gazun. Have a nice rest of the week and weekend. And I'll see you on Monday. Next week, show up. Because I'm going to spend a whole week reviewing Dr. White's style for the final. Over the weekend, I will be uh, putting out the final points breakdown. How to study for the final? Use your hourly exams as practice uh, problems. Will I give the exact same problems? No. But will I give similar ones? Well, look at my problem set. Yes. So with that, I'll say goodbye. Don't forget to do lab. Don't forget to do your test. Have a great weekend, rest of the week. Bye.